So with it being, with us knowing that this is the last, is King's last speech, right? You're gonna hear some differences in some of the things that he's bringing up opposed to some things that were um, taught about King that's more um, familiar, right? So when you think about King, you think about civil rights struggles, right? You don't hear him often talk about um, class issues, right? In the way that he's told, we're, ta we're taught King. Um, but in this speech, he's dealing with class, right? He's dealing with anti-war politics. Um, he's dealing with mobilizing around power and using economics to mobilize around power. So, so to me, there's a, a subtle shift in tone as it pertains to Martin Luther King. It's a shift in things that he finds of interest. It's a shift in things that he's focused his organizing around. Um, he even mentions human rights, right? Whereas in the past, he strictly is focused on civil rights. Now, keep in mind, we're doing a comparative analysis with what Dr. King is working with, and then also what we read and we heard with Malcolm X last week, right? And we know that Malcolm X is pushing for human rights in his speech, The Battle in the Bullet. Um, so I wanna say this speech is given in 68. Um, Malcolm X, I believe, made his transition, I wanna say in 66, let me, Keep that, I'm gonna look that up real quick. I don't wanna be accurate, but I'm pretty sure it's 66. But the important thing is, I mean, this, this speech for King was given after um, 65, excuse me. So Malcolm X was assassinated in 65. So the important thing though, is this speech for King is given after the assassination of Malcolm X, okay? So you can see how a lot of, um, things that Malcolm was advocating for has influenced the, the work of Dr. King. And, and, in, and in turn, a lot of the things that Malcolm, Martin Luther King was advocating for towards the end of Malcolm's life, he was more comfortable with advocating for as well. So in the early stages of their careers, they were at polar opposites, but towards the end of their career, you kind of see them more aligned. And I think that's something to be attentive to. Um, so a couple of things. He mentions, um, you know, the importance of the of unity among the enslaved, right? He said he used the, the um, example of Pharaoh and what Pharaoh would always do to keep the enslaved enslaved was create dissension amongst them. So the unity amongst the enslaved will cause for enslavement to end, right? Um, as I mentioned, he says, is a human rights issue that are facing all people of color. So again, thinking about Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X was a, inter, interested in a global liberation. He was attentive to what's going on in Africa. He was attentive to what's going on in Asia. We see the same thing here echoed with Martin Luther King and his human rights being a, a, a global issue for people of color. Um, he's organizing for workers' rights. Um, he's calling also for the U.S. to be um, live to live up to what they say they're about, right? And he doesn't name the Constitution, but he says, you know, I've let I've read somewhere that there is the freedom of speech. I've read somewhere that there is the freedom to assemble, right? So he's talking about the Constitution, and what he's saying is he's making an ethical critique, a moral critique for the United States to be what they say, what they claim to be about, right? Um, He's also like Mal Mal Malcolm X, he's using the intersection between religion and politics. Whereas Malcolm X though, he, he's, he seeks to separate it. Um, Martin Luther King sits comfortably with the intersection of these two realities, right? Um, he, 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 let, he reels off a name of a list of preachers who are engaged in the civil rights struggle. And he says, you know, preachers should be concerned with social justice issues, right? It shouldn't be um, for preachers to be self-centered to just focus on them. It should be about serving the masses, right? Um, he says, you know, the preacher should focus on problems of the poor. And, and at this time, Martin Luther King is organizing what's called the Poor People's Campaign. So his energy has really shifted around the poor and a class critique. Um, he's also calling for the preachers to be attentive to the quotidian struggle or to the daily struggles of the people, right? Um, be attentive to the daily poor. Right, it's, it's, he says something to the effect of, "It's okay to think about the um, angels in the right white robes, but you must be aware of the people want to have clothes to wear." Right, so be aware of the everyday realities of the people in your congregation. Um, he's also attentive to this to power, and, and I think 
prior and early his, in his career, he doesn't really deal with power explicitly, but in this speech, he names power, right? And he names economic power. And he also implicitly, he talks about the economic power of black people and the ability to withhold that power through the boycott, right? Um, and, and finally, to me, what I've heard in this speech more than others is an urgency in King. Um, he, you know, he said that if you got class, skip class. You know, if you have prior obligations, skip those obligations, but be at that march, be at this assembly because it's that important, right? And, and to me, this speaks to the urgency of his message. And I also believe, um, like Malcolm, right, he's attentive to the fact that his life is coming to an end, right? Um, he, you know, he says, I long King says longevity has its rewards, right? I, I want to live a long life. Longevity has its rewards, but he knows it's not time for that now, right? So he knows that his time on this earth is coming short. And I think that informs the urgency in his message. So for me, those are the things that I found of importance. Um, we'll go ahead and jump into our fishbowl. And then from there, we'll determine whether you guys want to break out to groups and have um, discussion questions or just answer it as a collective whole. Um, I know for group A, the majority of the people in group A have already fishbowled. Um, if you have not fishbowled and you're on this Zoom, you should volunteer yourself so that way you get your full credits. I believe we're coming to the end of the semester. We might have like three or four more meetings. Um, so if you're not getting that fishbowl credit, you're not going to get your participation points. Um, so is there anybody that wants to fishbowl? And for the fishbowl, you could um, talk about anything you found of interest, or you could um, talk about what I've mentioned already. So I'm, I'm assuming everybody on the call has fishbowl already. All right. So um, show of hands or just let me know, would you guys prefer to just do the discussion questions as a group, or would you prefer to jump into the breakout groups for the discussion questions? as a group. All right. Anybody else want to chime in? As of now, we'll do it as a group. As a group is good. OK, so we'll, we'll move it as a group. Let me put the um, questions in the chat, and then we'll um, jump into those. All right, it's not letting me post the paste. Hold on. So I'll read them off to you guys. And if not, I'll just type them out. Um, so our first group discussion question, how is this reading of MLK problematized common understandings of who Martin Luther King was and what his activism was about? So again, this kind of talks about, this kind of speaks to what I was mentioning early. Um, we are taught typically one understanding of Martin Luther King, right? Um, passive, non-aggressive, non-violent um, civil rights Martin Luther King, right? Does what you guys read or what you guys listened to in this speech, did it problematize that understanding of King? Did it reveal things that have not been revealed as regards to what King was about and what his activism was about? Um, so that's essentially the th thrust of, our, of my question. What new revelations, what new insights did this reading of King give you juxtaposed to which you were taught about King in the past. And we'll open up for, for conversation. So anybody could jump in. You need me to repeat the question? Do you understand the question? Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah. All right. So we were given 
So take it back. When you're in your K through 12 education, right? When you talk about black history, when you talk about black studies, one individual that you always approach is Dr. Martin Luther King, right? So at that time when you were introduced to Dr. Martin Luther King, think about what you learned, okay? Now think about what you learned then and think about what you just read and listened to this week. Is there anything new that you found out about Dr. Martin Luther King that you did not know prior to listening to this? Is there new ways that you understand what his activism was about that you did not know prior to listening to this? What new revelations, what new insights did you glean from this reading of, of Dr. Martin Luther King that you did not know in the past? So did this reading teach you anything new about the activism, the organizing, or just Martin Luther King himself? Y'all with me? So if you just break it down to the most simplistic form, what did you learn new about Martin Luther King from this speech? I think overall, like what we learn normally in like grade school and elementary school is just like the, his I have a dream speech and that's all we kind of hear about. And like his um, regarding the really civil rights movement and stuff like that, but we never really, hear the discussion of like I guess his boycotts and the idea for um well I guess regarding this speech how he was um talking about the Memphis sanitation strike I like never heard about that speech in general so I think this speech was more engaging you were able to learn about other stuff besides what we learned in school if that makes sense Absolutely. Thank you, Miracle. Um, anybody else learn anything new from the listening or the reading of the speech than you learned in the past? Um, I did. I know how last week we talked about how many people critiqued him and Malcolm X and how different they were because it was known that um, Martin Luther King was more of like, keep it peaceful, keep it clean. And then Malcolm X was like, no, you have to do what you have to do. But what I saw here that the one thing that they did have in common was I believe in his speech for Martin Luther King, he said, people need to stay together and they need to maintain unity. And that's one of the things um, Malcolm X said on his speech in the initial, the initial one, because I think he talked about leaving religion all aside. Mm -hmm. He said that everyone was on the same boat and we, we were all gonna like catch hell from the same man. So that's like the one thing I saw that was different that um, they both had this had in common. No, it's a, it's a great comparative analysis. So if, if we think about what Cassandra said and we think about what Miracle said, why do you guys think that this version of Martin Luther King is not taught in schools? Why are you not learning this speech in your K through 12 education? I think for the same reason that we don't really hear about Malcolm X, they don't want us, um, I guess history doesn't really want us to hear the sort of violent part of it or not the violent, yeah, I guess sort of the quote unquote violent part of it and the activism that isn't just peaceful to actually create change. They kind of just want us to like be in the sort of peaceful side. So that's why we don't hear about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I do wanna, um, cause you said something that I think the whole class needs to really be aware of. Um, you said the quote unquote nonviolence and you started to say nonviolence and you kind of took a step back and amended yourself. Why, why did you do that amendment or why did you use the quote unquote nonviolence? Because I think, I mean, I think like they tell us it's violent per se, but I don't think it actually is violent. If you want to create change, I think I was sort of thinking in the mindset of what like we've learned in history rather than what it actually is, which is giving people rights and giving people the actual freedom that is stated in the constitution and stuff. Absolutely. So fundamental question, right? Um, and, and you guys may not know much, but from what you guys know, have you ever heard about Malcolm X actually doing anything violent? Have you heard about him shooting anybody? Have you heard about him beating up anybody? Have you heard about him doing any actual violent activity? No. No. 
And, and that's to Miller, Miracle's point, right? They have positioned him as a violent individual, but there's no actual evidence of his violence, right? So if anything, he theorizes on this notion of violence, but he himself has never been violent. In fact, towards his later years, if you read his autobiography, when he's trying to establish the organization of Afri Afro-American unity, one of the critiques of Malcolm was that he was all talk. He would talk about violence, but when times would arise where violence would be necessary, he never showed himself to be violent. So I only bring that up to show you how the media can position someone as one thing when in fact they're actually not, right? All right. And then you saw that too during the summer when all the protests were happening. You only saw, I know for like example, my house is very Hispanic. So we listen to, so we, so we watch like Univision and Telemundo and stuff. So they tend to really um, drum, dramatic, dram, what's mm -hmm. the word? Dramaticize. They over exaggerate. Mm -hmm. yeah, they over exaggerate everything. And at first, like I knew that it was very peaceful, like the ones around me, but the ones you saw on like all the news was like the how it got out of hand. So it's kind of like the same thing, yeah. I think. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then too, right? So for me, when I'm watching the things take place and I'm looking at the so-called rioting, when I seen people doing it, they weren't people of color. Like just for what the, the shit that I was watching, it was white folks breaking up stuff. You know what I mean? So again, how they can shape things and make them look a certain way when that may not necessarily be the case. And media has such a stronghold in this country to where no matter what outlet that you receive it from, you perceive it as truth, right? So if you watch Fox News, then that's going to determine what your vision of truth is, right? You watch CNN, that's going to determine what your vision of truth is. MSNBC, they're going to dictate and determine what your vision of truth is, right? And again, these are four different news entities, but they all sit on different sides of the political spectrum. So of course, we have um, Fox News, ultra right, right? Um, and CNN is, is positioned as something that's more neutral, right? But they still have their own agenda. Um, if you're looking at far left, you may have like local publications like KPFK radio. Um, NPR may be something that's a little more positioned to the left. But they all have political agendas and they all shape the way that people understand and perceive truth. All right, so um, the second question, I'll put it in the chat and I'll also read it. Um, so it starts off with a quote, men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It's nonviolence or non-existence. That's where we are today. So what is the meaning of this passage? Um, and then what is Martin Luther King's implications for nonviolence? So if you, so my, and when I say his implications in the sense that he's saying it's either nonviolence or non-existence, right? So what is he implicating? What is the, um, what is gonna be the outcome if the society does not take up this notion of nonviolence in Martin Luther King's perspective? So again, we have the quote, men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they just talk about it it is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It's nonviolence or non-existence. That's where we are today. So again, what does this passage mean? And what is Martin Luther King prophesying or what is, he, what is his foresight letting people know what would happen if society does not shift to a nonviolent stance? Uh, when was the speech? Uh... Uh, when did it happen? 68. So, uh, oh. Oh. oh, my bad. Do you want to go? Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, like, that's like in the middle of the Cold War. Okay. So, uh, I actually thought, like, <laughs> uh, so hey, check it out. We'll go, uh, Ariane, and then Precious, you're next. Okay, well, that's in the middle of the Cold War. So he could be talking about like the nukes and all that because that was a lot of tension between us and Russia. So he's probably saying like, we can't fight each other because if we do, everybody will die or stuff like that. Or it can be taking the more 
um, black nationalism approach, where if what was it again? It's nonviolence or non-existence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where if they fight, like they take it the way Malcolm X was saying, the all fight, like fight back type of way, they could just be oppressed more and essentially just be eradicated. I like your multi-layered analysis, Ariane. So one, he's, he's doing a temporal analysis, right? So he's saying, okay, we're in 1968. And when I say temporal, it just means time. Um, we're in 1968, what is going on in, at that time, right? It's the Cold War. You know, and I, I don't know if it's the, is it the Cold War? I, I wanna say it's the Vietnam War. I think it's a little bit past the Cold War. I, I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not that up on US history, but either way, you're right. The same time period, I believe. Okay. Um, so in this time we're fighting, um, the world is at war, right? The world is on the precipice of nuclear war. Um, Martin Luther King is um, advocating against the civil rights movement. So he's very much attentive to what's going on in the world. It's not missed on him that we're on the precipice of a nuclear holocaust, right? Um, so that's one level of how if the world does not take up this notion of nonviolence, it will lead to non-existence because it was very much a thing to where after these nukes get set off, that's the end of the world as we know it, right? That was very much the conversation of that time. So, and then at the, at the smaller level, he's talking about what directly Martin Luther King is talking about. And, and, and I think you're right, Ariane, I think he's being, he's talking about both, but directly he's talking about to these people in the South, right? And his people are organizing around workers' rights. Um, and also, right, this at the 68, which is also the birth of the Black Panther, okay? And um, also coming off the back of what Malcolm is talking about with this red hot summer. So there's been riots that's been taking place throughout the country in the years prior to him giving this speech. So he's witnessing all of these things take place, right? And he's saying, not only will black folks suffer under this um, violence, but the state as we know it is gonna suffer as well because the way that things are going, and this is very aligned with what Malcolm is saying, right? The way that things are going, the urban areas are going to continue to tear things up. They're going to continue to be riots. They're going to continue to be rebellions. There's going to continue to be unrest because these needs are not being met. And if you continue to respond with violence when people are advocating for their human rights, all that's going to do is lead to just the end of existence, right? Because if you continue to oppress the people and you're not alleviating that oppression, you're forcing them to, to enact in violent ways, right? That's the only option that they have. They say that a rebellion or a riot is the language of the unheard. I'm gonna say that again. A rebellion or a riot, what they may call that, is the language of the people who are unheard, right? So if you go on for really centuries being unheard, you've been rebelling, you've been rioting, quote unquote, right? And you're still being unheard, the next way to go is engaging in a higher level of violence, right? Hence the ballot or the bullet, right? So when Martin Luther King is saying, if this continues, it's only gonna to lead to non-existence. Uh, Precious, were you gonna say something? You guys pretty much summed it up, that's, yeah. But put it into your own, on your own words, so we wanna hear what you were gonna say. Okay, so like by non, when he says like nonviolence or non-existent, I feel like he means that like if you don't keep a nonviolent protest, then your rights can be like like they probably won't see the change, and they'll just think that you're very, like violent and that you don't deserve your rights. So actually, Preston, you brought up a, a different point and it's a, it's a very astute point. This is actually how he starts off his speech, right? Um, he says any little of violence will divert the attention of your movement, right? And he, and he mentioned something that happened in the past, right? Y'all all know what happened yesterday, right? He said something to that effect. And he's talking about, um, I believe like a Molotov cocktail was thrown during a peaceful pr uh, protest. And essentially what the media did, they didn't focus on the peaceful protest, they focused on the, non, the, the Molotov cocktail. Kind of what Cassandra was talking about, how they sensationalized the violence, right? 
So what Martin Luther King is also saying, what Precious is talking about, is how when things of seeming violence gets done, it diverts all the attention from the progress that nonviolent protest is gaining, right? So to me, this falls into the trap of what I call respectability politics, right? So we're gonna protest, we're gonna march, we're gonna rally in a certain way that makes those who we are protesting against, rallying against, feel okay, feel that we're doing it in a way that they view as respectable, right? So I'm marching against the government because the government is not providing my, me my human rights, but we wanna make sure that we march and we protest in a way that the government respects. You guys follow me on that? So now to me, here's the conundrum. One, you're marching because the government already doesn't respect you enough to treat you like a human, right? But now we're gonna cultivate and mitigate how we march to try to get their respect. You're marching in the first place because they don't respect you, right? So to me, if that's the case, you're within your right to do whatever is necessary to garner that respect. There's a, um, a quote by Audre Lorde, who is a, um, a, a black feminist um, author. And she says, you cannot use the master's tools to tear down his house. You cannot use the master's tools to tear down the master's house. What does that mean? Is that like essentially saying you can't oppress the oppressor? Like you can't use their tools. You can't use their tools to tear down like the the system that they've built. Like we can't do it internally because they it's like they they're the one with the tools. Absolutely. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. And so think about what we heard last week from Malcolm X, right? And think about his critique that he made on the right, the March on Washington. That's what he said. So they're gonna tell you where to march. They're gonna tell you what time to march. They're gonna tell you, um, they're gonna send a police protection for you to march, right? So they're determining and they're dictating the whole way that you're voicing your grievance against the state. So how effective is that gonna, is that gonna be, right? So if the whole purpose of, of, of protest, of marching, of rallies, of uprising is to disturb the normalcy, right? How are you, how is it gonna be effective when they give you the details on how to do this to make them feel comfortable? That defeats the purpose. That's oxymoronic, right? So again, to Alyssa's, what Alyssa's saying, you cannot use their tools. You cannot use the things that make them feel comfortable to tear down their house. So if somebody wanted to come in your home right now, are you gonna give them some tools to, to tear your house down? Well, no, you're not gonna do that, right? You're gonna do all that you can in your power to maintain your home. And this is what we're saying. And this is what Malcolm is being attentive to, right? But to me, this is where I would say Malcolm, Martin Luther King falls somewhat short. He falls victim to this notion of, of respectability politics. And we see that play out in our society today. Um, well, if he would have just pulled up his pants, you know, they wouldn't have stopped him. Um, if, you, if Sandra Bland wouldn't have been so argumentative with the police officer, she would still be alive today, right? Um, so these are all these notions of respectability politics. Um, if you wear, don't, don't wear a hoodie, that would prevent you from um, receiving um, police brutality, right? Wear a, a tie and a suit, that could pre prevent you from experiencing police brutality. These are all things that are, falls under this notion of respectability politics. And, and fundamentally what it does, it takes the focus off of the oppressor, off the victimizer, and it places the, um, the emphasis, the intention on the victim, right? It's no different from saying for somebody who's been raped, well, if you wouldn't have wore that short dress, then you, know, you probably wouldn't have been in that circumstance. No, that's not the problem. The problem is the man who raped you, right? That's the real issue. So all these notions of, of respectability politics, in my estimation, divert the conversation from where it needs to be. And that's the people who are doing the um, subjugation. All right, um, we'll, we'll move on to the next quote. Let me put that in the chat. All right, so 
So I'll read the quote and it's, it's also in the chat as well. Um, secondly, let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. The issue is the refusal of Memphis to be fair and honest in its dealings with its public servants who happen to be sanitation workers. Now, we've got to keep the attention on that. That's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day and the press dealt only with the window breaking. Read the articles. They, sell, they very seldom got around to mentioning the fact that 1,300 sanitation workers are on strike and that Memphis is not being fair to them. And Mayor Le, um, Liab is in dire need of a doctor. They didn't get around to that. So again, I'll, I'll read the passage one more time. I, I kind of already mentioned it, but we'll, we'll go through it again. Um, secondly, let us, let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. The issue is the refusal of Memphis to be fair and honest in its dealings with the public, sorry, in its dealings with its public servants who happen to be sanitation workers. Now, we've got to keep the attention on that. That's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day and the press dealt only with the window breaking. I read the articles. They very seldom got around to mentioning the fact that 1,300 sanitation workers are on strike and that Memphis is not being fair to them and that Mayor Leob is in dire need of a doctor. They didn't get around to that. So what's the meaning of this passage? And um, so what, what is, what is, why is that important, right? What, what is Martin Luther King wanting us to think about and what he said and why is that important? So what's his thesis? What's his argument in that passage? What does he want you to understand? I think there's two things that play here. Is he saying that when violence, any type of violence is like present, what everyone focuses on is that instead of what's actually happening? Absolutely. Yep. And it, and it kind of goes to what I was saying earlier, right? Um, the ability to shift the attention to something else, right? And, and, and I, I was using the example of respectability politics, right? But I think what we're reading here is why respectability politics become so um, prevalent, you know, because people who have goals don't want those goals to be diverted by um, the ability of media to misdirect. So it's important for us to remain violent start to remain nonviolent because any type of violence will deter the attention from our goals. Um, Valeria, were you gonna say something? Well, I was just gonna compare um, to like what has been happening out throughout this year. Cause um, through the protests and also with other things, even though we're not the ones causing the violence, it still like applies to us. For example, with like George Floyd, he didn't use any type of violence. The violence was with the police brutality, but they like ignored the police brutality and focused on him, just saying like it was his fault that it happened. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think too, right? Um, what, I, what I found was interesting and it was extremely fascinating to me. These whole street uprisings took place because of violence done to black bodies, violence done to, um, brown bodies, right? And the way that the state, the way that the government responded was with more violence, right? So you have people literally protesting police brutality, right? Peacefully protesting police brutality. And the way that the state, the government were directed to respond was to enact more violence on the people who's protesting the violence, right? So. And then it's like, well, we're not going to use, uh, we're going to use rubber bullets because it's not lethal, right? But I don't know if you guys seen, actually seen an image of these rubber bullets. One, they're not rubber. They're, they're metal. <laughs> and people are literally losing their eyes. Um, people have had permanent brain damage by being shot by these rubber bullets, right? It's quote unquote rubber bullets. Um, when you have wars, 
there's called rules to engagement, right? There's certain things that you cannot do when you're in the state of war. So if the United States is going to fight Russia or something like that, there's certain things that you cannot do. Yes. Eileen, can you um, speak your point, please? That's a very good point. Sorry, I was unmuted. Um, like basically how that ties with like white imagination, how like build like like how the media is like, oh, it's just rubber bullets, but they're not telling people how they're treating them at like point blank range or like how it's like, I'm pretty sure like they're like this big, I think, yeah. like the size of my hand. And about like that round. Yeah. Good point. So which what Alina is saying is that this is just how the white imagination and the and sorry the white innocence plays out in our world today, right? So we're not we're not really shooting them with real bullets. We're using these rubber bullets, but these rubber bullets have just a not just as bad. You're not dead, but I mean your brain damage. You lose an eye, right? Those still have some very vast implications, right? So that's that's a very good point. But as it pertains to war, there's what called rules of engagement. One of the rules of engagement is you cannot use tear gas. Right, that's against the rules of engagement in war. So in the Iraq war or whatever the case may be, tear gas is not used. But they use tear gas on United States citizens during a peaceful protest. Like, like put your mind, wrap your mind around that. So you cannot use tear gas against foreign enemies. But that's justified to use tear gas against United States citizens. Right. So when you talk about these notions of violence, to me, I don't I don't I don't think that the subjugated communities, I don't think that the marginalized communities, there's no such thing as um, violence. Right. It's for me, it's self-defense. And what happens is the justifications of violence is what, what they call force, use of force. It's only justified because of power. That's the only that's the only thing that makes it justifiable, right? Because the government has the media to make the um, violence seem acceptable, to diminish the severity of the violence, right? They have laws in place that support the um, the ethical need for these so-called violence, right? So these this is how violence gets turned into force. Violence gets turned into force by power, right? And Martin Luther King is attentive to the way that power works. He's very attentive to that. But what happens is because the power is not in the hands of the subjugated, of the marginalized, their violence gets viewed or gets depicted as irresponsible, right? Because there is no um, news agency that speaks for the marginalized groups, right? There's no um, laws that are set in place that allow the people who are being marginalized to combat the people who are doing the marginalization. Are does that make sense? Do you follow how the separation between force and the separation between violence? And the only separation is who's in power. Because if you look at it fundamentally, the violence that the state does is far greater than the violence that the citizens do, right? And oftentimes the violence that the citizens do is to property where the violence that the state does is to people. And you tell me what's the greater risk on human life, on the humanity or the overall well-being of a society, a building or the people who make up that society? Does anybody else wanna comment on um, the, the, the question in the chat as he's talking about um, violence ability to shift focus on what the issues are as it pertains to injustice? I don't have something to comment exactly on that, but I have like something kind of to on that. How like when they shift like the the focus on violence, they only talk about like if it's like like with the Black Lives Matter, they only focus on that, and it's like oh that's why it's so bad. But they never really talk about how like when white people like when white like protesters with armed guns like they don't like there's no tear gas, no like riot gear. They don't really focus on that. 
house. Very true. Um, what's his name? Kyle Rittenhouse, right? White boy drove from, um, I want to say a suburb in Chicago to uh, Kansas City or something, right? And, and killed three people. And literally walks past the police with his AR-15 in hand, flashes them a hand sign, and they let him go about his business. I need to get on water. Did they get Douglas? They gave him water too. And they gave him water. Yep. Um, shit. Dylan Roof, right? He killed six people in a church. Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe nine people in a church. They arrest him successfully, right? No um, major issues. They take his ass to Burger King before he goes to jail. And, and if it was a person with color, they would have gunned him down right then and there. Straight up. Burger King, yeah, right. You wouldn't have got to the farm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. This, this, is, this is the contradictions and the fundamental issues that, that we're dealing with, right? Um, the fact that the president on his way out can tell a group of vigilantes to stand down and stand ready, right? How is that not inciting violence, right? But when, when the marginalized communities try to respond in kind, they're being unreasonable. So really, we have to look at these notions of violence. Um, and, and really, let's break it down flat, right? The way that we're taught in school, that's violent. The fact that we don't know this side of Martin Luther King is a violence done to us, right? The fact that we don't learn about ourselves as people of culture in this society, that's a violence done against us, right? Think about the process that we had to go through to strip us from our language, to strip us from our religious understandings of ourselves, right? That's a violent enactment that has been done upon us. So even to just exist in the society that we call America, violence was necessary, right? Think about the Native Americans. Think about the indigenous people. Did they not experience violence? But when it comes for us to advocate for our freedom, we're entrapped into this notion of being nonviolent, right? What was the, the founding fathers? Their credo was give me liberty or give me death. How is that not <laughs> clamoring for violence, right? All right, so our, our last question, our last topic of discussion, just, you know, where are some of the similarities that you found, and, and Cassandra talked about this a little bit already, but some of the similarities that you found between listening to Malcolm X and listening to Martin Luther King, um, what were some of the differences that you found listening to Martin Luther King and listening to Malcolm X? So let's kind of discuss the, uh, the, the comparative analysis of the two speeches. So Helena, was there anything that you found different, anything at all between what Martin Luther King was up to and what Malcolm X was up to? Any differences or any similarities that you found? Um, I found more similarities than differences. They spoke out against the truth. They were both straightforward and eager in their words, which um, I, <sighs> They were they were both different. That's all I could pretty much say. But what I could say about Martin Luther King and the I have a dream speech when I think uh, I want to go back to when we're talking about why we learned um, the dream speech instead of this speech, because I feel like they're they only showed us the perspective and his outlook of what he wanted to do, but not what he did to get to that perspective which he, they didn't show us the process of what we should do to get to that point. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, anybody else? What were some of the differences or similarities between Martin and Malcolm? George, did you find any similarities or any differences between Malcolm and Martin? Uh, for for me, when I was reading about like the readings, like there was like some differences, some similarities that they had. But overall, I just feel like they can't be the same person and like a different person at different times. You know, like they both have like different pers perspectives, like on 
like on the what's what's called on the like on the right for like humans, you know, like for people of color. Mm-hmm. Like the way I see it, it's like they, they they're just both like kind of like different persons, but it's like there, there could be times where they could be like the same person. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And I think how um I think how um Malcolm articulated it. Our objective is the same, right? We both want freedom, but our tactics to get to that objective may differ, right? He'll use the tactic of nonviolence, where I'm willing to use the tactic any means necessary to get to the objective of freedom. So yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, what about like, so is one what they're talking about, right? They're, they're both talking about very similar things, but when we get to the question of method, how they talk about what they're talking about to me, that's where I see a, a great deal of difference. Did anybody pick up on the differences of their method, of their how? Has anybody um, been to a Baptist church? Yeah, I I have my my nephews. My nephews mixed, so we share. That's a mix. Okay. Yeah. Okay, for sure. All right. So, so let me ask you this: When you, um, when you've been to that church, did what you heard from Martin Luther King sound a little familiar? Yeah, it's very spiritual. Yeah. So keep in mind, though, right? They're they're both in effect preachers, right? Malcolm X is a Muslim minister. Martin Luther King is a Baptist preacher. So they're both in, in religious context, right? But for me, what I noticed, one, Martin Luther King talks hella slow, hella slow, right? And I don't know if you guys been down south, but everything is slow. I remember one time I went to go to a fast food restaurant and that shit took 45 minutes. And I almost lost my mind because I couldn't understand why fast food is so fucking slow, right? But everything, the pace of the Southern culture is slowed down, right? And that's why you hear, even in Martin Luther King's diction, it's a very slow cadence, right? Whereas Martin, with Malcolm X, he's from the North. He's in Harlem, right? If you think about Harlem, Harlem is moving. Harlem is fast paced, right? And if you listen to the tempo of Malcolm's speech, it's fast paced. It's in tune with the tempo of where he's at, right? He speaks the language of a Northern black man, right? He speaks the language of the streets. Whereas Martin Luther King, He's very much situated in that Southern Baptist tradition, right? He's a preacher and, and that preacher, it oozes out of him in his speech giving and the way that he talks and the way that he relates. So for me, from a standpoint of method, that was the biggest um, bifurcation that you found between Martin and Malcolm. It's just their cadence, the way that they spot, they speak. The, and, and really where that stems from more than anything is their audience, right? If you're gonna be a good orator, you have to know your audience, right? I can't come to this class speaking Italian if nobody speaks Italian, right? It won't make sense. So just in kind, right? I can't go into a community that's a church cussing all the time, right? That's gonna turn them off, right? So I probably wouldn't do well in the church, right? So Malcolm knows these things and Malcolm knows I'm in Harlem so I can't come to the streets of Harlem talking like a preacher because they ain't going to hear that shit, right? So you have to know your audiences and your audience dictates how you will deliver your message. Now, what will be interesting um, is to hear the speech that Malcolm X gave when he went down South and uh, Martin Luther King was in the jail in Birmingham, right? I would be curious to hear what was the cadence, what was the diction, how did he deliver that speech knowing that he was in the South? the speech that was delivered in the church, right? So for me, as an intellectual, I would be curious to hear how that would sound coming from Malcolm, being attentive to his audience and being attentive to a spatial reality of being in the South. Um, who else? Who else has some, sep- um, some differences or some similarities about what we read? Um, how about you, Wasan? What are some of the differences or some of the similarities of Malcolm and Martin? We'll get two more comments and we'll call it a day. Um, Wasan, you got something for us?
All right, Esperanza, do you have any uh, thoughts on some of the similarities or differences between Malcolm and Martin? Esperanza? Jocelyn, do you have any ideas on the differences or the similarities between Malcolm and Martin? Can I go? Yeah. So I feel like I think you mentioned it earlier, but to me, the biggest like similarity that stood out to me was the phrase ballot or the bullet. And I took it kind of like what Martin Luther King said, like nonviolence or non existing. So it's either like the bullet will be non-existing because it's the violence and the ballot will be non-violence. And then um, there was like the last quote kind of because both are so used to this like violence being around no matter what side it comes from. They're both kind of like over it. It's like, it's gonna keep happening. And what Malcolm does, he shares a lot of examples of this violence. For example, how um, in his speech, I remember he mentions like, we gave our freedom, we gave our blood, we gave our like free labor to them. And they wanna go and talk about how rich this country is without mentioning that we made this country rich. And then in Martin Luther King, like he doesn't directly talk about that. But he does say, he, um, he states, I don't know what will happen now. We got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now. And I kind of took that as like, it doesn't really matter what happens. Like, it's going to happen at, at the end of the day. Like, violence is going to be used against us. Or they're going to frame us for violence that we didn't cause. Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, you said something now, like. I had to rip off you and I forgot what I was gonna say. Mm. Try to get it back in one second. Repeat what you said again, Valerie, and it may come back to me. Well, for Malcolm, it was like, he mentions, he gives examples of different said, things. God, thank you. Yeah, um, so, so not to cut you off, but you, you made me remember. Um, so one thing when you talk about Malcolm X and you talk about method, right? Even when you read his autobiography, the way he goes about his speech giving, he's gonna give you an example, right? He'll give you maybe three examples, but those examples are gonna to lead to his overall point. Or he'll make a point and he'll give you three examples to support that point, right? And what, she, and what Valeria said about Martin Luther King is not so direct, it's more roundabout, right? Think about the Bible for those who read the Bible, Think about Christianity as a whole. One of the things that's very use, used a lot is metaphors, similes, right? Um, parables, right? They'll use stories to indirectly get you to a point, right? So again, when you talk about this audience, Malcolm is attentive to his audience. And the street man, I ain't got no time for no, no parable, bro. Give me what you need to know. Right? And give me some examples of that shit so I can know you're talking the truth, right? So that's the way that Malcolm delivers his speech. Whereas again, in the South, it's slower. Time is not of such so much of an essence, right? I have the time to give you a parable to make you think about what I want you to think about, right? I don't have to be so direct with you, right? Um, I could use the simile, I could use the metaphor because this is a culture that is embedded in this idea of the simile and the metaphor, right? So in a class, when we're talking about the oral tradition, we have gotten to the point to where we see how the tradition is manifesting itself based on its spatial reality. So based on the area that it's located will determine how the oral tradition will take, take root, right? So as this oral tradition is evolving, we're seeing how time, we're seeing how space, how the temporal spatial is shifting the way that the oral tradition is becoming manifested. So um, next week, we're gonna get into like the Black Power era. Uh, we're gonna read a little bit of Black Panther literature. 
Um, we're gonna lead, read a little bit of Stokely Carmichael who made the term black power famous. Um, we may even watch a video, um, especially since we're dealing with, we've been talking about this notion of violence or nonviolence. and I might throw a video in there with you guys, but I, if so, I'll post that on the Google Classroom site by Friday. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of discuss the video and the readings for next week. Um, so next week we'll be back split up, group A and group B. Um, my apologies to group A, I, I put the wrong video up. Um, is there any other questions or comments for me before we call it a day? All right, you guys be safe, be healthy, be well, drink your water. Um, if you guys have anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Please, please, please stay on top of your uh, group assignments because it will get here before you know it. And I, I want to see some really good presentations from you guys. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out if you guys have any questions. Peace. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. You guys have a good one. Thank you, Professor. I have a question for the group project. It's we're doing two things, right? It's um a journal for the song we chose and then a presentation. No, no. Or is so it combined. I, I, I probably confused you because I, I said think about how you engage your journal. So the same three paragraphs that you have for your journal address those questions in your project. So in your project, you should have a, a thesis of what the song was about, right? What is the artist talking about? And what was the artist's argument, right? Um, you should talk about their method. So how did they lay out their method? Is it descriptive, right? Are they using metaphors to get you to understand what they're talking about, right? So that's the how they go about it. Um, you're also gonna talk about um, how you made an analysis of what you heard. So I heard Rhapsody talking about this, um, this pertains to a video that I saw. That's your analysis, right? Okay. And, then, and then finally, how does the song pertain to what's going on today, right? So how does Nina Simone's Four Women fit to what's going on with Black women or women as a whole in society today? So those are the three points that I'm looking for. Um, and the only reason I mentioned the journal is because those are three things that I'm looking for in your journal also. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically like we're converting the journal into a presentation. And yep. there's any way we could present it, right? Totally up to you. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I had a question. Well, if someone added to our group, I remember seeing an email, but I couldn't like find it. Oh, uh, let me see, bro. Um, I, I believe so. I believe so. Yes, so um, Chris has been added to your group. Let me see. And I believe he should be CC'd in that email that I sent to you, Arion. Yeah, so it's Chris Castro, Alyssa Wasan, and yourself. Yeah. In that. Do you want me to send you Chris's email? Yeah, that, that would be nice. Thank you. One second. Right, that should be that should be there for you, bro. So it's you, um, Alyssa, Wasan, and Chris in your group yeah we have a a group chat okay and... bet yeah okay cool. uh cecilia you had a question yes i do um so for the next meeting in our groups um do you think we could go out in breakout rooms for a quick second just to meet up with our group members because i made a google doc with um my group but we, I haven't been able to reach out to them. Like I left like a note, but I don't think they've gone back to me. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to set some time aside for you guys. Um, what, I, what I'll do is we'll, um, when we end, I'll create a breakout group for you guys to go to. 
And then okay. I'll just Thank you. open and let you guys have some time to handle that. But um, it's designed, and I'm doing this because you said they haven't gotten back to you, but the way that it's designed is for you guys to set some time up on your own, right? It shouldn't be okay. going to you. But I, I know that you tried to reach out and you haven't heard back, so I'll do this breakout group. Um, are you group yeah. A or group B? Uh, group B, so Thursdays. Okay, and then do you know? Okay, so we'll, we'll do that on Thursday. If you could do me a favor, just shoot me like a reminder. Um, either in class on Thursday or before class, just so I can have that fresh in my mind and I'll remember to create that group for you guys. Okay. And then uh, the only other thing I wanted to ask about, so for next week,